For this round of testing, I'm looking at Le Mans Ultimate. This is from the same studio that brought us R Factor 2 all those years ago, but now under the Motorsport Games umbrella. Some of you may disagree, but to me, it's like what Assetto Corsa Competizione is to the original Assetto Corsa. It's generally an improvement in quality, but because of all the licensing, it's restricted in the amount of content. But I think it looks and sounds great. In July 2024, we had a big update along with the launch of the new DLC, and I was hoping they were going to fix a replay issue. The replay graphics are not controllable, at least that I can find either in the menu or in the files within the game directory. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. I did an Algarve AI race. So this is port mouse circuit, full grid. I'm in the LMP2, and I did a lap. Here's the starting lap. And then I watched that lap in the replay from my cockpit. And there we can see, obviously, V-Sync is enabled. I couldn't find a way to disable it. So from a benchmarking perspective, I can't use replays. Instead, I have to do every resolution on every card as a manual run. So in this clumsy example, I'm using a 3060 Ti to emulate a Samsung Odyssey Neo G9 where you have dual 4K. So I'm taking two of my monitors. I want them to run in Nvidia surround and be treated as a single full screen. But unfortunately that does give me a um, natural halo beam right down the middle of the screen. Very awkward, but it's also showing you the inconsistency that's going to happen when you race against AI. I'm trying to maintain my position on grid starting sixth, and I want to finish around sixth, and I want to have as much side by side with the AIs as possible. So therefore they're running at novice, which gives me the opportunity to catch up when I make mistakes. In this example, it went down to as low as 18 frames per second. Let me tell you, the force feedback does not work well when it's chunking along that slowly. So there's going to be some run-to-run -run variants. They're not going to be identical benchmarks. It's close, but not identical. I'm also excited to add this into my analysis. This is an estimate of other hardware I don't have based upon the results I do have. But I want to make it clear, the gray bars are estimates. They are not real values. They're my best guess. It's better than, you know, scribbles on the back of a napkin, but it's not actual results. So please keep that in mind that it's just there for easy reference. If you'd like to support me in the work I do, check out my website for consultation services. Uh, you can go to my Patreon, become a patron for like $3 a month. And of course, subscribe to this channel and like the video. All right, let's get into it. To benchmark Le Mans Ultimate, I'm going to be using the SPA circuit LMP2 with a full grid. As usual, I'm going to be looping an example of a benchmark run uh, throughout the video. It's a three minute benchmark and it starts once I get the car straight here after the bus stop chicane. One of the biggest reasons why I picked SPA is because of turn one. They love to bunch up and this gives me the opportunity to just send it out wide, as long as I don't go into the new sand that's there. But I can avoid all of that close quarters door banging. As I send this benchmarking footage to the top and also expand on it to show you the triple screen perspective, beneath we look at the other tracks that I tested. At single 4K resolution with a 7800X3D CPU and a 4080 Super GPU, Bahrain was actually the worst performing because, well, I tested it at night and it's got a bunch of lights, so it's an outlier in that sense. I've already excluded Le Mans because it's just too long of a circuit, as well as Imola, uh, that first chicane is a nightmare with the AI, and Fuji, I despise it, so it's not on this list. So I went with Spa because it's demanding, it's got lots of runoff so that I can share the track with the AI, turn one is favorable, and I set the time of day to 6.30 a.m. So there's a little bit of sunshine coming through, but the headlights are on. 
Speaking of the weather, there is a change in FPS depending on what the conditions are. We see three obvious groupings. Both clear and light cloud are basically the same. I measured a 12% reduction in performance if it was beginning to rain or partially cloudy. And then the worst case scenario, which is heavy rain or storm, that saw a 20% FPS reduction compared to a clear sky. I only did this testing with the fastest graphics card I have and the fastest CPU, which means if you're using something a bit slower, maybe these weather impacts are more significant on your hardware. Next, I wanna talk about open practice versus race start. In this example, it's AI and again, single 4K. This time I'm at Algarve. The top one, open practice, this has cars on track, but they're all spread out fairly evenly compared to the next things beneath it, which is the race starts. I did four different races, this is the first lap comparing them, and you can see the consistency from run to run. However, I think it's safe to assume there's about a 5% wiggle room between the best and the worst result. With simulators that can efficiently handle the replays, that wiggle room is 2% or less. Unfortunately, I have to run real laps here for a uh, test drive Le Mans. I mean, God, Le Mans Ultimate. <laughs> Yeah, I, I stumble with that all the time. I mean, I did the 24 hour race all the way back in the 90s on my Dreamcast and I hope some of you did too. All right, back to the present and me still struggling with that 3060 Ti and 20 frames per second. Here are the cards I'm testing and my system specs. I decided to test with the high graphic preset. Ultra is available if you really wanna max everything out. I did tweak the visible vehicles so it draws all of them, and I turned off the live TV displays. Oh, and I've locked the perspective to the horizon at a medium strength. The lowest resolution I tested is 1080p. This would be the most CPU bound of all the benchmarks. The 4080 Super leads the way with 161 frames per second, while at the bottom of the list is the Radeon 6700 XT. It gets 120, but that is 25% slower than the fastest card I have to test. The biggest surprise is the Radeon 7900 XTX, which only averages 138.8 frames per second. It is slower than a last generation 3080 Ti. This is really strange to see, especially because the 3060 Ti and the 6700 XT are battling it out quite close. And if you've seen my other simulator benchmarks, you know that's normal for those two cards. So it's abnormal to see the 7900 XTX perform like this. When we look at GPU Busy, we see that the high-end cards have extra performance available to them. They have headroom. You could increase the graphics quality to probably ultra, but the lower end cards, well, they're currently running as fast as they can. To increase their performance, you should drop the quality presets. When I increase the resolution to a single screen 1440p, what we see is the 4080 Super and the 7900 XTX basically hold the same frame per second. At 1080p, there was a 15% difference between the two, and at 1440p, it's still 15%. The 3080 Ti only loses five FPS with this increase in resolution, but the two cards at the bottom, they both drop by over 20% as they take on this higher workload with the higher resolution. Here's the GPU busy chart for this resolution. And as a reminder, what we're looking at is what is the percentage of time during each cycle of frame the GPU is doing meaningful work. And in this case, the 3080 Ti has jumped all the way up to 94% busy. That means there's very little headroom left on this card. Sure, we only dropped five frames per second, but it doesn't have the headroom to take on a 4K resolution. And we'll see that next. At single 4K resolution, the gap between the 4080 Super and the 7900 XTX has shrank. It's only 5%. The 3080 Ti has dropped 24% compared to its performance at the 1440p resolution, and the two entry-level cards are barely able to get it above 40 FPS. They are struggling at this high resolution. Flipping to the GPU busy chart, and we see that only the 7900 XTX has a little bit of headroom. The other cards are running full tilt. Unfortunately, I don't have VRAM usage on this chart right now. I'll have to update that later. 
But I do wonder, did the 4080 Super achieve a VRAM restriction? It only has 16 gigabytes. And is that Radeon actually able to leverage its 24 gigabytes? That could be the scenario. Okay, so I teased you with this before, and here is the full chart for 1080p. And the philosophy I made this to is, is fairly simple. I'm using my fastest and slowest cards as bookends. For example, the 4080 Super is at 161 frames, and the 3060 Ti is at 122. And there are a bunch of NVIDIA GPUs that should fit performance-wise between those two bookends. And the same thing goes for the Radeon and the 7900 XTX and the 6700 XT. And through a, a convoluted calculation process, I'm trying to estimate what all the performance values will be for those GPUs. And this is what I come up with. Each one of these values represents my best guess. But there are so many assumptions to get here. First of all, the 7900 XTX has weird performance. And I'm assuming the other Navi 31, Navi 30, whatever GPUs in the 7000 series are also going to struggle. That may not be the case. But I've built out this estimate assuming NVIDIA has an advantage throughout the entire lineup based upon those results. As the resolution increases to 1440p, I'm expecting the gap between most of these GPUs to increase, that their differences in architecture and performance will showcase themselves in the average FPS that I'm estimating. For example, if you have a 2060 Super and you're looking to upgrade, but you want a big generational uplift, you could be looking at a 4070 Super, in which case you could expect, according to this chart, over a 50% gain in FPS performance at single force uh, 1440p resolution. Or if you have a Radeon Vanilla 6800, maybe you want to upgrade to a 7900 XT. According to this estimate, you might only see a 30% uplift in performance. So that's how you should look at this kind of data and how it could be useful to you. At the estimated values for 4K resolution, I've been able to manipulate this so that the Radeon cards kind of rise up the chart. However, I'm not as satisfied as recognizing their memory advantage that they often have over GeForce. So as I improve this tool and make these estimates better, I will share the results with you. Okay, let's go to triple screens and back to some real results. I don't have uh, estimated values for triple screen performance like I did with the previous ones. Um, this is just way more complicated and I haven't quite figured out how to do those calculations. The 4080 Super leads, but with only an 8% performance advantage over the 3080 Ti and 7900 XT, which are basically tied. And towards the bottom, we see an advantage to the 6700 XT with its 12 gigabytes of memory over the 3060 Ti. When we look at the GPU busy chart, it's actually interesting because we're in a bit of a CPU bottleneck still. Even though the performance difference is diminished between the top three cards, there's significant headroom available to the Radeon and the 4080 Super. At triple 1440p, the 7900 XTX gets ahead, ever so slightly on the average, which is definitely within the margin of error, but the minimums look promising, that 1% minimum of 73 versus 66 over the 4080 Super. Lamont Ultimate supports proper viewports. You can actually see that on the right-hand side um, of the car where you can see the image shifting. It's actually displaying that angled of the screen properly. In something like iRacing, we have SPS, which gives an advantage, or I guess SMP, which gives an advantage to NVIDIA in that rendering, but that's not available here in this simulator. There's nothing interesting in the GPU busy chart, so I'll just move on to triple 4K. And this is a big workload on all of these cards. It's uh, again, an advantage to the Radeon ever so slightly, but we definitely see problems at the bottom. Yes, I actually tried to drive this sim at 17 frames per second and the 3060 Ti at 11. It was almost impossible. I only got one successful run in on both cards. Without a 4090, I think all of us would have to reduce our graphics quality settings and try and find a mix that enables a higher frame rate here from the GPUs. 
I was successful in getting dual 4K to work on two 4K monitors as I'd shown before with Nvidia. I could not do that with the Radeon cards. They didn't want to run windowed at that resolution. They, I, Ifinity didn't want to work. It was just a bit of a problem. So I only have the Nvidia GeForce results here for you. So that basically ends the video. That's what I got for you. Um, I'd like to know your feedback. Is the estimate chart that I made for you guys, does does that look useful? Um, is it something that you feel like you could make a decision uh, based upon, assuming I can get the numbers as accurate as possible? Um, and do you have questions about this simulator? Personally, I like it. I think it's really good and better than what the Steam reviews seem to suggest. The force feedback is pretty good. I love how tires lock and how you feel that, how the car pivots and slides. Um, it's just really intuitive to me. The AI, having done now a hundred first laps with them, they're really frustrating. I think the biggest critique I would say is they don't account for human reaction time because they will move under the braking zone the second they are an inch in front of your car, or I should say the microsecond that they think it's clear to do so. Um, and that's just dangerous. And I, I think they really need uh, to look at that. But anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.